Hello folks and welcome back to our Model 3 drive unit inverter. Uh, I know this is turning into a little bit of a saga how I'm uh, taking as long as I'm taking to get this thing to work. Uh, there is a bit of a reason for that and that's what I just want to touch on before we move on to the next phase. Um, as anyone that's been following along will know, um, I have developed this little mod board, as I ca call it, and we wire that into the various parts of the in inverter logic board, and uh, this runs our open inverter system based on the STM32F103 microcontroller. And have some support circuitry on here for things like the resolver ex exciter and um, just actually just little very simple little analog filters and things like that in there. So my original plan with this uh, was basically that at this point I've got it all wired in. Um, I've tested it apart and I was planning about a week or two ago even that this would be the point where I would basically secure the wires uh, with the likes of some MS polymer and we would put the inverter back on the drive unit and run it. Uh, that was the, the plan. But for a reason that I couldn't quite uh, figure at the time I just kept putting that off and the more I kept coming back and trying to get myself to do this the more I just I couldn't make myself like uh, this particular method it does work at least here on the bench but I just whatever it is I cannot make myself like it and I think if I was to attempt to release this for people to do themselves that it's going to result in a lot of damaged inverters so we need a alternative uh plan so that is what we are going to attempt to do now so we're kind of going back to one of the original concepts that i had even be before i had access to uh, a model 3 inverter so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to uh turn the camera off and i'm going to undo uh, about the last six months of my work on this in about 10 minutes and by that i mean i'm going to remove the mod board and all of the little uh link wires here so Stand by for a little bit of movie magic because it'll only take about a second for you folks. And there it is, folks. About five or ten minutes, and our mod board is removed. Now, strangely conflicted about that. It's part of me happy and part of me kind of sad. But anyway, bye bye, mod board that's in the bin now we have ourselves a new plan so the one wire that we have left here on the uh, from the original mod board is connected to the XRS pin uh, or the external reset on our TMS uh, 320 Delfino e processor thingy here and there's a reason that we actually want that to be on there. So folks, um, I have got to do some more reverse engineering work on here. So let's go ahead and get set up for that. And we'll come back to you when we're kind of uh, partway through some of that. So we're back again. A little bit more movie magic for you folks. Uh, I'll bring you around here in a sec, but what we've got here at the minute is 
our Model 3 rear drive unit inverter uh, minus the mod chip which we removed in the last segment and uh, what I've done here is I have connected to the JTAG port of our uh, TMS 320F2837 microcontroller. Now you might ask me why I have soldered here. Um, I do have the connector. Um, I did get the connectors for that. But the pins are just so ridiculously small that I cannot crimp them. So the simpler option was just to uh, solder on. And I worked out um, what the pin out for the JTAG is just by um, doing continuity from the JTAG pins on the uh, microchip controller data sheet. And I picked up an Olimex XDS100 uh, V2 uh, JTAG uh, programmer and attempted using some um, TI software to uh, connect to the micro. And, you know, even before I started this, I was, you know, 99.999999% sure that it would do absolutely nothing. And indeed, pretty much that is what it does. Um, it does see that there is something there, but it will not uh, communicate with it in any way. And just from the kind of a cursory reading through that I've had on the code security module and the various other um, elements that are implemented in this particular device uh, leads me to, you know, the fairly obvious conclusion that JTAG has been either uh, shut off or is very heavily password uh, protected here. So we certainly can't go in there and halt the device and read out the registers and do any kind of um, hacky stuff like that. And again, I'm absolutely unsurprised by that uh, given the, the pedigree of this device but i simply had to try it's one of these things that i guess from what i could see out there certainly no one's published any uh data on attempting this um so i've attempted it here i'll show you guys what actually happens here now in a minute um but uh yeah so that is just one other avenue that i wanted to investigate here uh, for our Model 3 uh, drive unit um, reverse engineering. Now, as we, uh, as we move on in the next few segments, hopefully you will begin to see what I intend to do here, but no spoilers for the minute. All right, going to bring you guys in here for a little bit of a closer look. I'll show you what happens uh, with the actual computer now when we attempt to connect to it and uh, that'll be this segment Oops. okay so time for more of my dodgy camera work so let's bring you in here i can't get too close because of the silly microphone sticking out but you should be able to see that i've pretty much soldered on to the uh, pins at the jtag connector and this is our Olimex um, JTAG programmer there we go and uh, much here as you can see I worked out what the pin out is uh, there's a few pins there that don't seem to uh, connect but from looking at the official um, JTAG um, recommendations for this device uh, some of these pins here just connect to the 3 volt line via resistors uh, I suspect are for emulation functions and stuff like that it's indeed if we look here at the actual Olimex pin out you'll see that there's EMU pins here there's two of them so that's most probable what they are doing and just for my own fun I picked up one of these little cheap launch pad boards. It's not the exact same processor on there, but it's certainly the same family, uh, just so we could <clears throat> start to see what it would actually look like um, when we would communicate with it. 
So I'm going to have to pull into this. So that's what we've got. Uh, so I'm going to power this thing up and we'll show you on the computer uh, what we actually get. Actually, 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 actually get. Alright, so this is the TI uh, Uni Flash application that they uh, have for communicating and programming the um, their various microcontrollers. In our case here, we've got a connection here to the <coughs> the XDS100 V2 debug probe. So we're going to come in here and just uh, select the device 28377D and we are on this uh, XDS100. Going to hit start and if we go in here to uh, you know, obviously we can go to one of the CPUs and just hit read target device and it's going to go through its kind of setup and then it should you know pretty much just uh, sit there doing nothing uh, rather unsurprisingly um, we can go to uh, settings here and we can also ask it to well we could hit erase flash but if we just do a blank check even it just won't find it. Uh, sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Uh, it'll just basically sit there doing that. So, again, yeah, completely unsurprising uh, that there would be this level of security in there. Okay, folks, so at this time, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be showing you uh, the results of about the last two weeks of reverse engineering work on the uh, Model 3 rear drive unit in Varter. Now, this particular video is not going to be, uh, I guess, you know, focusing on the power stage and the silicon carbide transistors and all that kind of thing. That's not what we're interested in. What we're are interested in is to come up with a strategy better than my little uh, mod board that is going to allow us to use these drive units in EV conversions cheaply, uh, reasonably easily and with open source uh, hardware and software because that's one of the things that I very much believe in is that we need to be able to understand at least to some degree what we're putting in our cars and be able to maintain it upgrade it uh, and most importantly repair it so i have yeah been pretty much almost exclusively working on this now and uh, so we're going to get into this we're going to hopefully get to show you uh, some of the interesting things that we've discovered a lot along the way. I'm going to explain the operation of quite a bit of the circuits. I would say that I understand now about 80 to 90 percent of what's going on on this particular PCB. Um, whereas BBB4 with the original mod board was only probably 30 or 40 percent. So. That'll be this segment, uh, be this video. I don't want to get into what's going to happen next because you, you're going to have to wait about another week uh, for to see that part. But it's going to be fun. And uh, probably by the time that you're watching this, I will be in fact working on that next part and filming it for you. So yeah, you know, although it's been fairly quiet on Model 3, uh, drive unit territory for a while uh, the pace has definitely picked up over the last few weeks so that's enough about me talking uh, we're going to get right into this so if you're someone that well I suppose if you're someone that enjoys being bored uh, then continue to watch although otherwise I can recommend stopping and uh, going up there and searching for some funny cat videos 
Okay, so before we go into looking at the uh, circuitry, I'm going to just briefly show you a little bit of the workbench here. It's a complete mess job. Um, but this is uh, just to put it in some context when I'm talking about various uh, tests and things that I've ran on the board here to determine uh, signals. So obviously we've our inverter here in the middle. Um, we have one permanently connected wire uh, to pin 124 on the TMS320, that is the reset pin. I have a little, uh, just a press to make switch here um, that pulls that pin to ground. So if I turn on the power to the inverter, hopefully you'll be able to see, we've got a red and a green LED flashing here. Let me see if you can see that. Probably can't, so let me go and turn off the light. Bit of luck, that might be a bit better. I'm uh, Cecil B. DeMille stuff here today. So, if I press the reset button, say the light stop blinking because we're holding the processor in a reset state. So we can kind of control that. It's over on my left, as I'm right handed. So typically, I'm controlling the reset button with my left hand, and I'm kind of probing around with the right side. Uh, just turn the power off there. Um, in terms of being able to work on uh, fine pitch parts and stuff like that, I don't have any fancy microscopes or things like that. What I do have is this kind of a fairly cheap um, kind of a magnifier headset. Um, it comes with various magnification lenses. I only ever use this one, I think it's a 3.5. That's very handy because I can have that on my head and be able to use both hands then uh, for working on the um, circuitry. The other magnification device that I have, if I can find it in this complete mess, uh, Oh, it's gone somewhere. It's probably sometimes they end up going under the inverter on me because there's a gap. A little ah, here it is. It's a little hand magnifier. Uh, it's 12.5.5 x. It's pretty well beaten up. It's a little LED light in the back of that, so I can get in really close and kind of check for um, IC markings and stuff like that. Um, one of my newest pieces of test gear here is this uh, Keysight uh, 1204G scope and this is uh, something um, that I've used quite a lot here and I've found it to be, found it to be um, excellent uh, for the work that I've done here and um, particularly this model comes with the signal generator built in and that's been quite useful because I can inject a signal into a, a certain part of the board and then trace for it here um, uh, in different places as we will see when we get into the nitty gritty. Up on the top of the bench here, we have another Keysight instrument. Uh, this is a six and a half digit multimeter. Um, it's 34461A. Uh, this guy obviously is a little bit of an indulgence and you don't really need something like this. But what I find is when I'm and I'm looking for particular signals and where they might be going. Having very good millivolt resolution enables you to differentiate signals. Um, so as we'll hopefully see later, like there might be something that's, you know, 3.2861 volts. Um, and I can hunt for that exact voltage around the rest of the board. Um, so anything that has you know, good resolution, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, something like this. 
Um, so let's see, what else do we have? Soldering, soldering iron. Um, this is one of my, this is a kind of a homemade uh, control station here. Very, very crude uh, for JVC uh, soldering iron. Um, so fine tip iron is uh, quite useful. Um, the JVC stuff I was really skeptical about uh, until I actually, you know, saw some people using them. And um, then I saw there was some designs published online for DIY controllers and I tried it and I've never looked back. So something that can get in there and solder in some uh, the likes of this ETFE wire um, or even like uh, wire wrap wire and things like that for signal tracing. Um, I don't want to turn this into a product re review vi video. So other than that, just a cheap power supply here. Uh, this is a 60 volt 5 amp. Uh, the reason I have that here is it enables me to inject some reasonably high voltages into the high vo voltage bus. And because uh, we needed to trace signals that only uh, become alive when there's more than about 25 volts on the high voltage bus. So that's what I need this guy for. And over there. On the uh, on the bench, then I've got a two-channel power supply, just a 30 volt, two amp per channel, which is nearly falling off the shelf. I should be careful of that. Uh, this channel is just used supplying about 14 volts, uh, just to the 12 volt line on the inverter. This one here uh, is what I call my perturbator. And uh, what this guy is uh, set to about three and a half volts, it is grounded to the inverter uh, ground. And you'll see here that there's a, there's a wire with a 120 ohm resistor connected to it. And that enables me to inject uh, signals, DC signals into the, um, into the Inver inverter here so a little bit of a run through just on what uh, on what we've got set up here um, so I'm going to get into position and we will um, commence the most boring part of this experience and uh, show you what we have learned so far Okay, folks, so for those of you at home that want to play along in this little adventure, um, I would recommend going to my GitHub uh, repo here, uh, where I have uh, collected the information uh, and continue to collect information on the Model 3 drive unit inverter. And it's that that we're going to be going through in this particular segment. So, uh, so basically go to github.com first forward slash Damien McGuire and uh, you will find Tesla Model 3 drive unit um, repo. And there's two files particularly that you're going to be potentially interested in. Uh, this will be the main one. This is the TMS 320 F28377D M3 pinout uh, pin map. So this is a spreadsheet uh, where I have made notes and worked out what pin does what on our uh, C2000 MCU. And the second file then of potential interest is the M3 TMS pinout diagram 1.pdf. So if you want to follow along, and I can't really think why, uh, then go ahead and grab these two files from the repo uh, because this is um, what I'll be referring to as we proceed here. So, here we go, folks. Um, so I'm not going to go into too many basics, um, except to say that obviously the role of this entire thing here 
is to convert um, high voltage DC from our battery into three phase AC and feed that to our uh, drive unit motor so that we can drive down the road. Uh, I won't be getting into what inver inverters are or differences between this one and, and other ones. There's more than enough information in the general sense out there. We're going to be dealing with the particular today. Um, obviously, um, this differs from any of the Model S stuff that we have worked on in the past in that it's a single uh, PCB board that uh, has both the logic power supplies and gate drive built into it. The parts that we're going to be looking at is going to be from the gate drivers back up, so kind of from the neck up. If you can imagine this is the kind of neck, down here is the body that does all the work, that's the power stage, but from here up is the brain, and that is what we need to under understand better. So, I'm going to start here at the uh, microcontroller, I'm going to work my way out. Now, at certain points in the video, I'm going to reference components that are on the back of the PCB. Now, I've been lucky in that uh, I was given some very high resolution photos of the back of the board, uh, of well, of one of these boards, obviously not this one. Uh, so I will be showing you some of those or putting some of those up in the uh, editing stage uh, when I'm referencing those components. So there's not too many parts on the back of the board, so we are lucky that way. Uh, most of them are on the top. Now one of the things that hampers the reverse engineering process with any of this Tesla hardware is what I refer to as the musk goo. And the musk goo is this kind of a conformal coating. Uh, it's a very hard, clear coating that he puts on all of his uh, PCBs. And it means that uh, one of the nicest reverse engineering tricks of being able to take a little bit of stranded uh, wire and just brush it around to trace uh, signals is not uh, really possible here because the musk goo will insulate uh, those pins and thus you need to um, have uh, certain tools in order to do that. Now I'm actually holding one of these tools here. This is a Harbor Freight seal pick, a memento from my trip to America a few years back. It's very, very sharp stainless steel um, point and I've bent it uh, slightly. And this I use um, in conjunction with some, uh, let me show you here, just in conjunction with a clip lead and I can stick the clip lead on and we can kind of dig in to get at pins and things like that. Also, uh, multimeter probes, standard multimeter probes that you get with you know pretty much any meter I've got a very kind of a rounded point on them. So I got some of these sharper ones, but even then, because these are brass, uh, they will tend to go dull uh, when you're poking into that musk goo. So I find a rub of a file now and again to keep that at an absolute super sharp point uh, is uh, a bonus. Now, so that's, kind of about enough of the tools and the set the setup. So let's uh, let's get into um, what we are looking at on the logic board. The I keep calling it a microprocessor. I suppose it shows how dated my thinking is. The microcontroller on this board is a TMS 320F 28377D. Now the D in the part number references the fact that it's a dual core uh, processor. So we have a 10 megahertz external crystal here. 
that is uh, multiplied by PLL inside and drives the, the cores at 200 megahertz each. And indeed, um, you will find that even after being on for, for only a minute or two in a relative idle state, uh, there is a detectable temperature rise within the package. Um, so just very quickly radiating out from the processor. Obviously we have our crystal that we mentioned. We have the 10 pin JTAG port. Now the JTAG port uh, is quite a small affair. I did manage to get and are reasonably easy to um, find. I got them from radionics. Uh, these are the pins and the, um, and the plugs that fit these. But of course the problem is that I literally cannot crimp the pins in such a way they're absolutely tiny little things um, in such a way that I can actually get them onto a piece of wire and get them into this and uh, I mean snap the, the uh, connector down so I'm trying to find looking around some Chinese websites and things like that if you know if, if I can buy a pre-made wire uh, to get at the JTAG port and there's a reason that we're going to want to do that you will have seen earlier that obviously the JTAG is locked out on this micro but we will be changing things so that that JTAG port will become useful so let's see let's try and uh, stop wandering off and focus on the circuit Damien okay all right so Moving out, um, the first integrated circuit that we see is this guy here, and he's designated U1. Uh, that is a 74LV4051, which is an eight to it's an eight line analog multiplexer. And it is used to select between one of six uh, temperature sensors. So there are six temperature sensors, including the one temperature sensor in the uh, drive unit motor itself that senses the stator windings. So we have five on board and six, uh, sorry, we have five on board and one off board temperature sensor that are multiplexed into, this is where our little diagram is going to come in here, because the analog to digital converter pins in this device are in this particular corner, along with the analog reference voltages and things like that. So if I can orient myself, um, our multiplex temperatures come in on pin, uh, can't even read my own printing, pin 50. So it's up here, and I'm going to uh, show you what that looks like on the scope in a second, because it is quite interesting. It kind of freaked me out when I saw it first. I couldn't figure out what it was. Um, so moving out then, we're going to see these SOT23 packages, and they're designated as D. So there's D5, D3, D10 here. Um, I thought there were transistors or some kind of diodes or something like that uh, but it turns out that these are all voltage references so they're like three volt uh, precision references and they're there uh, for the purposes of um, providing the voltage references for the analog to digital converter and possibly some stuff that I don't quite understand. I should point out that I'm kind of skimming as much of the data on the TI uh, device here as I can just to get myself at least a very, very top level understanding of what makes it tick. So, moving out here into the circuit, we have this device here, uh, which from the best of my measurements, I am determined is some kind of an op amp. Uh, I have no idea what that part does yet. 
This guy here, U6, is an LMV844 quad op amp. And the two amps on this side of the package are responsible for converting the uh, current sensors, which are up here, which are on phases um, A and phase uh, B. The current sensor outputs are 0 to 5 volts, uh, centered at nominally 2.5 volts when they're reading zero current. They go above and below that point then, depending on whether we're reading a positive or a negative current, so a current out of the inver inverter or a current back into it. And they're scaled by this, uh, this op amp and some of the passive components here, resistors, caps, and all that kind of thing, to the zero to 3.3 volt level at our analog to digital converter in our uh, TMS320 needs. So there's one op amp used for each of those, um, for each of those uh, conversions to the best that I can tell. It might in fact use all four, I'm not 100% certain on that. Uh, coming up here, another mystery part, this is another op amp. Again, I'm not 100% sure what this does. I suspect, and this is something that I can test, I suspect that it is used for scaling the uh, throttle signals. Uh, so our throttle signals, can we got two of them, two analog throttle signals. And they can be anywhere from zero to five volts and we want to scale those uh, again to the zero to 3.3 volts level that our um, TMS320 wants to see. This big guy up here, I'll get you the part number uh, for that, but that is a power amplifier that is used for driving the resolver exciter windings. And his friend up here is another op amp uh, that is used for the resolver feedback. So the sine and the cosine signals basically filtered and amplified uh, from here fed back into two analog to digital converter channels. The exciter runs at 10 kilohertz. It's generated from one of the DAC uh, pins on the TMS and basically fed to the exciter amplifier that cranks that up to about a 10 volt uh, level and pumps that into the exciter winding in our drive unit resolver. So then once we get the feedbacks back in, we can do some maths on those and determine the exact angular position and uh, speed and direction of our rotor, which we need for doing the field orientated control algorithms in here for controlling current. Up here in this part is the transceiver for one of two CAN channels on this uh, board. The uh, One of them is called Vehicle CAN and I think the other one is called Party CAN. Now, I don't know whether Elon likes to throw CAN parties, maybe that's why it's named after that. But the transceiver um, on the top, I'm probably gonna get this wrong. Transceiver on the top, I think is the vehicle CAN and the one underneath just hiding down here uh, is the vehicle CAN. And they're both terminated um, with a split termination. So they go, we've got two 59 ohm resistors a uh, little center tap to ground cap uh, set up and a little uh, common mode filter. So they are not isolated, they're just uh, filtered in a reasonable manner. Now, so here we've some diodes, um, input line filtering and things like, like that. I'm not gonna get too tied up with that stuff. Now coming over to the left, uh, there's a device here, U14. This is our LIN transceiver. So what do we have LIN for? Well, LIN is, is a single wire communication protocol, which I believe stands for local interconnect network or something like that. 
and we talk Lynn to the controller in the electric oil pump in our drive unit. As these Model 3 drive units have separate 12 volt powered electric oil pumps, unlike the Model S stuff that they're mechanically driven from the uh, traction motor itself. So it's our Lin transceiver. Uh, by the way, on the GitHub, I do have a list of all of these IC part numbers. I should have uh, mentioned that. So you'll see it as an IC list um, on there that I'm trying to populate uh, as much as I can as well. Now, I'm going to move on to the power supply. Well, one of three power supplies on this board here uh, in a sec. But before I do, I want to show you what the multiplexed temperature sensors look like. Okay, so here we have a, a scope shot of what the temperature sensor uh, multiplexer output looks like. Um, it's not terribly familiar now with how the whole um, uh, this Keysight bench view works, but thought it'd be nice to be able to show it to you rather than trying to film the scope. But basically what we get is um, each channel gets sampled for a period of one millisecond and there's six of them in there. It's a little bit hard to see, but you'll see if we run the cursor along here, as you'll see we have, this is our first one at 2.37 volts. Then as we move along, then we get to the next temperature sensor and the next one. And this one here, the one that's quite different is the, um, this is our uh, motor temperature sensor because the motor at the minute is sitting under the bench and the inverter is sitting on top of it. So it's getting some heat uh, from my heater here. So its temperature sensors are reading, uh, you know, kind of the same, kind of along this line here, whereas the motor is much cooler and it's sitting here. It's interesting to note that uh, the sensor is reading about 3.1 volts here when it's cool, so presumably as the motor heats up, this voltage is gonna fall down here, indicating a higher temperature. So that's uh, what our sensor looks like. And there's three, uh, let me get you back over here. There are three um, See if I can find them for you here. There are three, if I can remember, there are three lights. No, there are five lights, wasn't it? Um, so let me see here. Uh, there are five lights. There's one of them there. Um, there are three select lines on the multiplexer. Let me get you, uh, see if I can get you over here. A bit of Cecil B. to Damien time. Here we go. So that's one of the uh, select lines. Um, and then if we can get to the next one, will I get my little headset for you? If anyone knows how to use Bench View, it'd be great. I don't. Uh, here comes the next one. You can see that one's at a one's at a kind of a higher frequency there. And then finally the last one. This guy here, if I can find him, come on. There he is. So those are our three uh, multiplexer select lines. I thought they were square waves when I first looked at this, but uh, in fact, they are uh, counting from zero to six uh, in binary. And they're doing that about, as I said, about a one millisecond um, delay per temperature sensor. Okay, so next part that I want to talk to you about is this power supply chip. Now there's three power supplies in total on our uh, board here. This one derives the power rails um, 
such as the 1.2 volt core voltage, 3.3 volt IO voltage for the MCU, and plus and minus 5 volt rails for things like op amps, uh, current sensors, and stuff like that. And it derives those uh, voltages from the 12 volt, um, you know, 12 volt battery supply, I guess you could call it. Additionally, uh, it does some other rather funky things. Uh, so let us have a quick look at the data sheet for this part. Now, I actually had a little bit of a struggle uh, finding this data sheet because when I got the part number, which is TLF35584, went on to the Infineon website to get it, I had to sign up an account um, and do various other filling in forms thing. And then at the last step, when I went to get the data sheet, they told me that uh, it was a restricted document and I would have to contact my nearest um, agent or something if I wished to have access to this particular document. So I just poked around a bit and I found what I think is an older version. It's got a Rev2 2017 date on it here. Um, just on one of the component suppliers, the likes of Mauser or Farnell or somebody like that. So it's certainly good enough for uh, what we uh, need to do with it. Um, and just, I'm not going to get into all the detail on it, but it is uh, quite an advanced part. Uh, of a type that I have more so seen in use in things like consumer electronics, laptops, uh, computers, anything that has the need for its supply rails to change dynamically. So like when we're um, you know, changing the core voltage of a microprocessor for overclocking or a higher performance or sleep mode or things like that. And uh, so it's got a lot of these kind of funky features in it. And it's got this whole SPI interface in there. Um, and this is actually implemented in our, uh, in our um, drive unit. So they go through all of this. Now what I did uh, was I captured in this is on the github again i did some captures here oh, sorry that's the wrong one it's the eprom we'll get to that later this is our power supply spi so i did some logic analyzer captures here if anyone wants to have a look at them i haven't had a chance yet to kind of poke around and see exactly what they're doing uh, but the Upshot of it is that the part runs quite happily, even if there's no SPI in there. Uh, but there is one thing uh, that it is a little bit sneaky about that took me a bit of time to find. So let's go and have a look at our board again. I'll eventually learn how to do this Cecil B stuff a lot better. So, this is our power supply chip here. And there are two pins um, on this. They're called SS1 and SS2. Now, SS2 is of particular interest to us. Because the next thing that we're going to talk to you about here is how the... It's not a microprocessor. The microcontroller uh, controls the PWM to the gate drivers. So we have six gate drivers because in our three phase inverter we have uh, six power transistors that need to be controlled to create our three phase waveform. Again, I'm not going to get uh, too deeply into any of that theory at the minute. So when we were looking for the pins, like so, if 
for example, these are STGAP1AS uh, gate drivers, so we can look up the data sheet, and we see that pins, I think off the top of my head, pins four and five are used uh, for PWM input from uh, the microcontroller. So of course, you know, you'd no normally do something like go in there with a multimeter and try to find continuity or at least some kind of low resistance pathway uh, between those relevant pins and you know you just you know go around the micro to find the pins and rather unsurprisingly I found that that didn't work and unsurprisingly because I know that the musco gets up to some uh, trickery so I didn't get too tied up with that I figured I would uh, I would find out uh, eventually what was going on and there was nothing really apparent on the top side of the PCB here as to uh, what could be causing that so rather uh, we would need to um, take a look at the back of our PCB. So what I've got here is, as I say, one of a few uh, quite high quality pictures uh, that I was given of the rear of the uh, PCB. Now, the area that we're interested in um, is, let me see if I can get a zoom in here for you, is around here. So this is the bottom of the mic microcontroller. You see here we have these capacitors littered around the back for supply rail stabilization and things like that. And I don't know if the, I don't think the cursor is showing up here, but anyway, what could possibly go wrong? But if we look at the, uh, there's, a, there's a large hole here just on the left of the picture. And just to the right of that hole, you will see U3. And U3 is a 24 pin um, surface mount part. And after some investigation, it would turn out that U3 is a, uh, can I remember this? Uh, I probably can't. So it is a 74 LVC 8T245, which is a variant of an old friend of mine, the 74 LS245. And if you go over to the TI website and have a look at some of their application notes for using the C2000 microcontroller for motor control, you'll see that they use this exact part as a, a buffer between the outputs of the device and the gate drivers. And it seems as if Elon's uh, Elon's minions have done the very same thing. And we'll see here as well, if we go in a little bit nearer, you'll see that there's a series of three resistor networks, RN8, um, you'll see RN8, RN11, which are vertical, just underneath U3 then you'll see RN10. Uh, so, what have we got going on here? Well, the first thing is that the, for those of you that, that don't know, the 74LS245 is a bidirectional buffer. So you can send data either from, in this picture here, from the top pins to the bottom pins or from the bottom pins to the top pins, depending upon a direction input uh, signal, whether that's high or low. And there's another more interesting one called the output enabler OE line. And the OE line is used uh, quite interestingly in this uh, conf in this design. Now, so our problem was that we were unable to simply um, we were unable, as I said, to simply use the multimeter to find 
the signals from the microcontroller to the gate drivers because that buffer was in the way. And the buffer uh, would do something uh, rather interesting. Okay, so let's see if I can show you uh, what we found here. So I've got another little tap wire on here, which I will explain in a few moments, but just ignore it for the minute. And I've got to get my oscilloscope probe, which is here. Here we go. And I'm going to go on to a little pad here. Now, what you're going to see in a sec is I'm going to keep the scope probe on this little test point. It is, for those of you playing along, TP27. And TP27 is just down here at this kind of a bottom corner in and around the JTAG port on our uh, micro. So I'm going to sit the probe against that. I'm going to get you guys onto the old bench view. And you'll see there that that signal is at ground. Now, I'm going to push the uh, reset button on our microcontroller. And we're going to see that it jumps up high. And then I'm going to release the, uh, the uh, ground and it drops back low, press, and we go high, release, we go low, press, high, and low. So, very interesting, Damien, you might say. But, uh, what has this got to do with us? Um, what has this got to do with us being able to uh, drive the gate drivers from the microcontroller? Well, that little test point there, TP27, turns out to be connected to the output enable line of the 74. Uh, I'm just going to call it. The 74245, you guys can fill in the blanks for that. Now, so, when that line is high, we have a high impedance state uh, between the gate drivers and the microcontroller. So, no signal from the microcontroller is going to get to the gate drivers because the buffer is basically switched off. Now, when that line goes low, um, as you saw there, we can send a signal. Problem is, though, that when the microcontroller is in a reset state, the line goes high, and we can't uh, we can't send data. And there's a very strong driving force on that test point. Uh, that is being, it takes over 100 milliamps of drawdown uh, to pull that low when it has been driven high. So that tells me that there was something determined to keep that PWM switched off when the micro uh, was in a reset state. So, first thing that we were able to determine uh, was that there is indeed one digital pin on the micro and you will find that on your uh, diagram and spreadsheet that is one of three things three things three things that need to take place in order for that tp27 and thus the 245 buffer to enable the transmission of pwm from the micro controller damien yes thank you to the gate drivers number one thing is that, that pin has to be high Number two thing is that the second power supply, remember we said there were three power supplies, well the second power supply, which is based around this uh, transformer and a bit of surface mount componentry underneath, which we will get to you in a minute, this power supply has to be enabled. And what this power supply does is it provides the isolated gate drive voltages uh, for the high voltage uh, side, so from the neck down of our um, inverter. So that is the second 
condition that has to be met. We're simply tricking it with this little yellow lead here. We're pulling down a pin here, which again, for the ones playing along, is TP105. Once that's pulled low, the power supply enables the gate drivers, uh, the high voltage side, I guess you could call it, of the gate drivers livens up. And the power supply chip sends a I'm online signal um, towards this arena here where you see the two LEDs flashing. That is the second condition. The third condition is based upon the SS2 pin on our, mist, on, on our kind of super secret Infineon fancy uh, 12 volt power supply chip. And SS2 will behave in the following way. Approximately six to 650 milliseconds after the loss of SPI communication between the microcontroller and the TLF chip, um, SS2 will go low and thus the third condition to enable the 245 buffer is removed and we do not transmit data. So, all of that is handled by a little bit of logic on the back of the PCB. So let me give you a quick look at what that looks like. Um, I do not necessarily know what the part numbers are for any of these. I'm kind of guesstimating it. Uh, so let's get you in here, go up to the top. So let's get you in. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Hopefully you will. So there's three components up here. Uh, U5, U44, and I believe U42. So there's two uh, five pin and one six pin little SOT parts there. And again, I don't know. I haven't got part numbers for these, but a little bit of, I guess, um, experience with this sort of thing and a bit of lucky guesswork leads me to believe that what we've got going on there is some kind of a tree input NAND uh, type of a setup and possibly also a buffer like, um, oh, what's the name of it? The 74LVC 1G02, I think, or something like that to put a bit of punch into the OE drive uh, going to our 74245. So this guy, these little, these three chips here, um, take in um, the power good, I guess, signal from this U8 chip, which is our high, which is, is our, I guess, high voltage side of the, uh, gate drivers. Um, so once it says yes, I'm good, and we get a OK signal from the microcontroller, and we get SS2 being OK on our TLF chip, then at that point uh, we will enable the pathway for PWM signals between microcontroller and gate drivers. So that's cool. But there was one more problem uh, when it came to finding which pins on the micro um, actually drove the relevant gate driver stages. Let me just disconnect this for a sec. I'll get to what's going on there shortly. Oh, ah, really? Really? Seriously? Okay. Now, professionalism here, folks. Now, Right, problem was that in this reset state, obviously the last thing, this is full of errors and problems because, you know, it's not connected up to any part of the car and there's no high voltage interlock on here and various other stuff. So it's in an absolute panic state. The two Elon brains in there are going, ah, no, ah, shut down, do not PWM anything, ah, emergency. So. If I were to attempt to force a pin that was being held low by its relevant totem pole GPIO output high, then I'm gonna blow that low side of the totem pole. And at this point, I was 
being friendly with the device and I didn't want to do that. Now this is where having a meter um, that can read not exactly accurately, it doesn't have to be calibrated or something like that, but can read down into the low millivolt range. In that what I could do was I had already identified up around here, again just off the JTAG port, so like RN13 here, and some of these vias were in fact connected to the output side of the 245 and were going to the gate drivers. So logically there had to be some pins here then on the input side. Um, and I had some ideas about what they could be. But what I was able to do was to come in here and measure, so seeing like, you know, 1.245 millivolts and then look for that 1.245 millivolts up around here and that then equated to well there's some kind of a signal here coming from some pins here and looking at the data sheet for the part we can like there's a lot of EPWM pins available on this part but around this area here so up around the pin 1 vicinity there were some voltages that pretty much accurately matched voltages that I was seeing here so at that point, I had to take a chance and lift um, two of the pins here. And when I actually drove those pins with my little three volt um, probe, we could actually switch on and off. Uh, I think it was the B low and the B high here. So then we were able to work out, lift two more pins and that gave us the second. And then we were able to find the third just by a process of elimination. So. That then uh, covers our PWM, um, current sensors, and 12 volt power supply. Now, the isolated gate drive power supply here, um, as I showed you on the back, is that little U8 chip. I don't, I don't have a part number for that. I don't know what it is. But I did, I had found earlier that on TP106, if we pull that low, uh, that we were able to en enable the power supply. With a little bit of signal injection and tracing, I was able to inject signals along various uh, pins on the micro and find that they were controlling this line here. And then obviously on our, um, on our little uh, diagram here, I have it uh, PSU enable or gate PSU enable or something on here. Again, if you're playing along, you will find it on those documents. So that gave us uh, gate drive, current sensors, power supply, or let's say isolated gate drive power supply. Final power supply is this guy here. Uh, which is U36, which is a Viper 20A, which is a chip that I use well over 20 years ago now for making a, a one watt LED driver. This guy here operates independently from any of the logic or the 12 volt power. It is driven by the high voltage. And from what I can figure out is a kind of an emergency power supply uh, for the isolated gate drive uh, stage in that if we were driving along in our automobile with Elon beside me at the wheel and all of a sudden we were to lose the uh, 12 volt power supply then we would have a permanent magnet motor connected here spinning at some very high rpms which will all of a sudden become a generator with the weight of the car to uh, give it energy all of that energy is going to come in here and if our gates are in a floating state then bad things would happen so in this case the viper based uh, power supply is basically still getting power because we have high voltage on here and can ensure that the gates of our uh, devices stay in a 
safe state. They can be turned off, basically. Could be wrong about that. I don't know, but that is uh, kind of what I guess. I suppose is a fair is a fair is a fair um, is a fair um, interpretation of what's going on here. So, what's next here? Um, I won't go into too much detail. Like finding things like what. Uh, you know what things like the throttle signal and stuff like that basically just means injecting um, just from a power supply and tracing the signals onto the pins on the micro that's very straightforward um, there was no particularly weird gating or any of that kind of thing going on here now next up you're going to see here that we have two eight pin um, I guess pad sets here. I, oh man, my head. Too much Tesla. Um, pin outs, pads. What do they? Uh, profile. No. What they call? Oh God. Okay. There are two eight pin SOIC devices missing here. There is another eight pin. SOIC device just underneath the board here. Let me see if I can uh, do my little bit of board um, looking for you here. Probably getting bored by now. Um, so let's go over here. And in this case, it's actually missing. Uh, so maybe in this board, it wasn't fitted. So it's U15. As we'll see, it's up near the kind of pin one on our uh, on our TMS micro um, controller, right? Turns out that at startup uh, there is a burst of activity on several pins here, and it turns out that that little eight pin device that's on the back of the PCB here is a is an E squared. And at reset, we get a burst of activity uh, going on there um, between the microcontroller and the um, E squared. And the difficulty was that it is a very quick. Uh, Burst. So let's see if we can show you just very quickly what some of this looks like. Uh, this is not continuous. As I say, this only really occurs on resets. So I'm going to push the reset line and release it. You'll see the little burst of data. So we can scroll around some of the different pins here and we'll get uh, data on some of these then when we. It's actually so quick that um, I don't think the scope is capturing it there on the uh, on the uh, viewer thing. It captures this one, I guess, because it's a bit slower. Let me uh, see if I can make a fool out of myself um, with my fancy uh, my fancy old silly scope. Here we go, so we can go over and resume. So I just change our trigger mode there, so we might have some chance of being able to see it. Um, there we go. So that's one of the pins there on one of the unpopulated um, pads. There's another one. So yeah, so we'll see that there is a pretty typical um, SPI kind of a uh, transaction going on there, but it's a very it's a very fast, it's a very quick uh, trans transaction. Um, oh, what's happening now? Stop it, Keysight. I am really making a fool of myself with this, am not I? Um, Okay, let's 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 <laughs> yeah, let's not pretend to um, let's not pretend to know how that works. 
uh, some more stuff for me to learn. Um, but it would turn out uh, that there is a, let me see here, I'm pretty sure I have it in the spreadsheet because I've forgotten the part number, of course. Okay, so here's our spreadsheet. Let's see, we get you guys on this spreadsheet here. Uh, there we go. Okay, so EEPROM. So yes, here we go. It is a 25LC256, uh, which is a microchip part, and it runs at a 2 megahertz uh, clock speed. So quite fast. Uh, what I did as well on here is if you go into the EEPROM uh, directory on the GitHub, you see we have a few logic analyzer captures uh, for that. Um, so what that is doing, I have no idea. Um, it should be possible to read that without having to take it off the board. There used to be a thing called a Pony Pro Programmer. I don't even know if that still exists anymore. Pony Prog um, that I used to use way back in the day for programming. Uh, oh, it is still going around. Uh -huh. Pony Prog is still there, yay. So yeah, I used to use this for um, programming PICs and EEPROMs and things like that back in the day. So it's still around, so I might be able to rig up something and try and read that out. Uh, so maybe that is something that I can do, or if someone else has some info on that, then uh, do let me know. Now, next thing we want to get onto is our third SPI, because we have three SPIs going on on our uh, TMS320. So we've dealt with the EEPROM, we've dealt with the TLF uh, power supply chip, but there's another one which I have here is gate SPI. So we've again got uh, logic analyzer captures. And for those of you interested in reading those, um, I can never spell this right. I guess the Sailey logic is the name of the little um, analyzer that I have. If you want to look at those um, captures, you can just download their software. It's free and you can just load them up and have a look in there. Um, again, you know, I'm not I'm trying to turn this into a product review video. I have a very, um, I have a very basic uh, little one of their um, analyzers. Uh, I actually won it in a competition way back when, but it's this, you know, tiny little thing um, but it can, it's got eight channels on it and go up to 24 megahertz. So I don't even think they sell this one anymore. I think it's that old, so no idea. Anywho, um, that proved itself with the Model 3 BMS stuff because uh, there was very few things that I had that would actually capture that. Anywho, uh, there's one more SPI that we needed to talk about. And that is the gate driver chips. So let me grab the data sheet just very quickly for the gate driver chips for you. Will completely bore you to tears. If you're not watching a funny cat video by now, you're doing something wrong. So this is the gate driver that our Musk friend uses. And uh, this one is Let's scroll down here. This one has, of course, functional description, has an SPI interface. Of course it does. So, um, interestingly, all of the chip select lines are tied to one pin on the microcontroller. Uh, so all of our chip select lines here are tied to one so when we talk to one gate driver we talk to all of them this is a continuous spi process uh, the gate drivers do seem to work perfectly fine without this um, but i do want to find out uh, what they're talking about and what elon is um, is conversing with our st friends about now you see some diagrams there 
Um, and rather interestingly, if I had bothered to look at the data sheet, Muppet Head, I would have seen that they do just that. They tie all of the chip select lines together. Interesting. So, okay. Um, they also do something here that I want to show people because I know that one of the one of the pushbacks that I'm going to get on this is going to be about uh, Tesla Magic. So let me see here a minute. There is a. Uh, I think it is in here. Yeah. So these devices uh, have got something called desaturation detection. And I'm not going to get into too much uh, detail on that again. This isn't a power electronics course. Um, but they're very good at protecting the device, in this case, the SIC MOSFET, uh, that they are dri driving. Now, and one other thing that I want to show you, this is it. It's rather important. The way that they're wired up in the Model 3 drive unit very much mirrors what you're seeing here in this data sheet. In that, what they call this is hardware cross-conduction prevention. And what that means is that we cannot physically, even if our microcontroller goes completely gaga, and decides, oh, I'd like to blow up the inverter to today. Let's turn on the high side and the low side at the same time. It cannot do that, at least by means of the control signals. Because when we're driving the high side, we are automatically holding the low side off and vice versa. And to go one step further in the, uh, in the Tesla implementation, by means of... The fact that even when we have, so I've got pin one and pin two lifted here. But so if we go, uh, let me get my scope here. That'll be the easiest way to show you. I do have, uh, I do have my fancy meter here, but I don't have a network cable to connect it to the computer. So that's going to tell you how professional that we're de that you're dealing with here. So I'll just use the scope to show you this. Um, so let's go, uh, window, Cecil B. to Damien. So we're back on here. So if we go to the, uh, low side, so this is pin two, I believe is the low side. We see that that's high. So that's at 3.3 volts. So that is being activated. Even though the pin on the microcontroller is lifted, we have a high on that line there. So if we now go to the low side, which is this one, we see, or sorry, the high, the high side, we see that that is being uh, held low by means of some of those resistor networks that are uh, hanging around with the 74245 that we showed you on the back of the board. So that's high and that's low. So it's quite a uh, quite good few levels of redundancy. Uh, built in there okay must be getting near the end Damien but no there's more of course there is it's a Tesla product now hopefully we are getting near the end two more things to show you I think but I'll probably have forgotten more anyway so yay all right in the middle going to see this array of rather high power surface mount resistors and in the normal application there's this little pad that sits which I can actually replace back on there now anyway um, that sits on top of them and when this is bolted into the drive unit this is pressed against uh, some of the metal in the drive unit uh, for purposes of heat dissipation so what does this thing do, you might ask? Well, this is responsible for discharging the high voltage DC capacitor. So underneath the board here, in this area, there is a large capacitor. I can actually read off some of the, uh, I can actually just about see on the front here. 
I actually read out the part number for you if you so wish, and why the hell not? It'd be rude not to. EM four three one five five one E one W A one H A Z, and it is a five fifty plus sixty eight microfarad plus zero point six eight microfarad capacitor. Uh, with a DC rating of 430 volts DC. So, it would not be good, particularly with a film capacitor, which has a very low leakage, uh, to leave that charged up and have some, somehow, some clown to disconnect the high voltage battery connector and then manage to get his two fingers into this and get a kick from the capacitor. So we've this resistor network here, which is, I've managed to forget, haven't I? Uh, yes, I have forgotten. Well done, Damien. I did remember, uh, no, I've, I've, I've forgotten. I'm just gonna have to measure it, because um, I'm too lazy to calculate it, so that'll tell you something. Uh, probably also too stupid to calculate it. It's four kilo ohms um, of resistance with quite a bit of power handling by nature of all of the parallel uh, parts here. And they are switched across the DC bus by means of this transistor, which is Q6. An old Q6 um, has another friendly transistor pal here called Q23 that controls the gate of him. I'm assuming this is a MOSFET of some sort. Now, once the DC bus gets above about 25 to 28 volts DC, um, this circuit activates and turns on Q6, which connects our 4K power resistor across the DC bus. And I thought, oh, well, you know, there'll be, a, there'll be a pin on the microcontroller here that will decide when to activate and deactivate the, uh, the discharging, right? Well, no, there actually isn't. At least none that I've found yet. Instead, um, it is controlled manually. So there's a device here called U33, which is a Broadcom optocoupler. It's a, actually a high-speed digital optocoupler. Uh, I've forgotten the part number. I think it's A49T, HCPL A49T, T, T for Tango, T for T, which I'm going to need to get soon because I'm going horse. Uh, this guy. And he's not controlled from the microcontroller. Rather, he is controlled by means of some circuitry here. There is a device underneath here, kind of underneath where my finger is, which is a dual comparator. There's some um, resi resistors here that are connected to the HVIL pins on the high voltage DC connector. They're also connected to the HVIL pins here on the uh, signal connector. And what happens is we have two pins, uh, pin four and pin 23, they're HVIL in and HVIL out. And what happens is the, uh, now can I remember this? I could be wrong here, but I think it is the high voltage controller in the battery. So this thing, this is the BMS controller. This is the high voltage controller. So I think this guy generates a 20 milliamp current loop that loops around all of the high voltage components in the uh, in the high voltage system within the Model 3. So that 20 milliamps comes in through HVIL in, comes through here, comes through the resistors, there's a little LT, uh, a little LT um, low noise op amp here. The current passes through these resistors, goes through these two pins, which normally when the plug is inserted are shorted together. I've just si uh, simulated that here with a uh, clip lead. Then they come back out and out through HVIL out before making their way ar around and back to the high voltage controller. That current has to be between 15 and 24 milliamps 
for it to be considered valid. And it seems to be that it likes 20 milliamps uh, to be the nominal current. Once that current is detected, um, two things happen. The first is that the optocoupler here shuts off and thus shuts off Q6, which disconnects our high voltage bleed down resistor pack here from the DC link capacitor. And the second thing is one of our ADC lines on our microcontroller um, gets a scaled version of that. You know, it's, so it's a, the current is converted into a voltage fed to one of the ADC lines, presumably, so that one of the Elon brains in there can monitor the, uh, the HVIL current. Now, that's how our high voltage interlock works. Uh, what else have I not covered for you here? Hmm. Let's see if I can remember anything else. Okay, so one or two last little things to, um, to catch up with before we wrap up this particular segment. Uh, you might notice here that there is a red LED. And this red LED here is connected to all of the gate drivers and it is connected to one of their pins, uh, which is an error pin or a kind of a fault error pin. If I can find it here, it is called a uh, Diag1. It is pin 10. So all of the Diag1 pins are tied to get together and are connected to this LED and they go back to a pin, obviously, on the micro. And that wasn't that easy to find either because that's buffered as well, but we managed to find it. Um, yes. When the gate drivers are in a working state and they have their high, their isolated supply working, uh, the Diag1 pin basically goes high. Um, so I can demonstrate that to you here by just activating the um, just by activating this little pin here for the isolated supply as soon as we bring that on obviously the uh, gate driver is going to a working state and they're perfectly happy they also don't seem to worry if they lose SPI which I can demonstrate just by pressing the reset button you know they will work away as we proved originally with the old, uh, with the old original mod board um, that we had on here. So, what else have I missed here? I'm probably missing a lot of stuff, um, but that is about what we have learned about our Model Three drive unit, and we know quite a lot more about what's going on here we we know what i guess you know most of the most important pins here do um so that's important um and we have in the works a solution for this um i'm not going to uh to tell you what it is i'll tell you it was will involve this scalpel it will involve some nice shiny new um tips for my soldering iron so what else have i made oh yes 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 one last thing one last thing there is of course one last thing i nearly forgot um one last thing that the micro does right now it does two more last things so there's two more last things yes it senses the 12 volt DC vo voltage via one of the analog to digital converter pins. And it also senses the high voltage DC voltage by one of the analog uh, to digital converter pins by means of this guy, U31, and the little friend of his in here, which is so small, I think it's U6. Um, this is a Broadcom, um, I forget the part number, it's on the GitHub, it is a um, isolated voltage sensing op-amp isolator thing 
and it basically gives you, you can measure between zero and two volts. You can scale that with some simple resistors. It gives you a differential um, analog output, which you can con um, which you can combine to a single ended um, output with an op amp. And that's fed in to our uh, microcontroller analog to digital converter. So are there pins here that we don't know about? Yes. Um, am I going to find out what they are? Maybe. Um, but that will be dependent on how the preparation for phase two goes. So folks, I know everyone's probably bored to death at this stage uh, from looking at this, but before I wrap up this uh, video, I do want to just say one thing, because I know it's going to just get asked, uh, so I want to address it. Um, we are not going to be running this drive u u unit by means of CAN emulation. And what I mean by CAN emulation is that we convince it that it's installed in a Model 3 and uh, run it uh, via CAN bus commands. Now there, best of my knowledge, at least one person that has actually succeeded in doing that and has made a standalone controller for it, and that's brilliant. Um, one of the reasons that I'm not going to be doing that is that I'm not nearly smart enough to do to do the level of uh, kind of software based work that would need to be done to uh, make that happen. So is that a good idea? Do I think that that's a good way to go? I think, yeah but it's just not going to be the way that I'm going to go with this. So, I guess the easiest way to uh, explain that is that we've all got to work to our strengths and our be beliefs and abilities and so forth. And I very much believe in being able to openly work um, with this. And... Uh, so the solution that we're going to present to you in the next installment of this semi-exciting series uh, will be a completely open source and will give you the ability to uh, have, I think personally, a lot more control over the drive unit. So, folks, I'm going to wrap this up here for you. Uh, now because I am quite hoarse after all of the explaining. We will be, be back soon. Uh, we will be then going through the new uh, solution that we have for this. And I do hope that you will join me for that. In the meantime, as always, do not forget to dislike unshare, unsubscribe, do not support me on Patreon or PayPal or any of those kind of things because it'll just make me do more of this stuff and that's bad. Uh, I will say if anyone, and I know this is probably hopeless, uh, but if anyone would uh, be so kind as to have a look at the spreadsheet and the diagram and see if I've screwed up somewhere, that we would be much appreciated. And with that said, there's nothing left to be said then until next time, folks. Happy TMS320F2837-7D learning. <laughs>